Hello and welcome to DeVry University's virtual conference, Future Ready Skills and Inside Look. I am Dr. Shantanu Bose, provost at DeVry University and located in the Chicago land area. I am honored and delighted to welcome you to today's event. The upcoming sessions have been created with you in mind. The topics throughout the day are meant to help you think about your own professional and personal future. You will meet with business leaders who are subject matter experts from various industries, sharing with you tips to help you handle the current changing norms, questions you should ask yourself now as you, as you consider your career next steps, what working on an agile team looks like, setting goals and overcoming your fears, and much more. I hope you can stay the entire day, but if you cannot, no worries. You can jump in and out of the sessions as your day allows. We'll be here until 4 p.m. Central Time. Among our many experts, you will meet with Groupon Chief Technology Officer, John Higginson, who will talk about experimentation and what Agile is. You will also hear from two recruiters with Cox Enterprises who will share tips for virtual interviewing. This afternoon, we have a keynote chat with Bob Biglin, CEO at the Center for Advanced Emotional Intelligence. What is in emotional intelligence, you may ask? Bob will explain that. You will also meet Alexandra Levitt, an author and futurist who will introduce you to the idea of durable value, which is making yourself indispensable in the workforce. The day will close with an inspiring chat with US Olympian, Ilana Myers Taylor, who balances life, training and learning. Hear her amazing story and learn how she achieved it all. You may also notice drawings happening in real time. This is our graphic recorder, Claude, diligently taking notes, graphical notes, which will be made available for you on our website after the event. So, to kick the day off, I have the pleasure of introducing a very special guest, Dr. Bob Arnott. After medical school and training in internal medicine, Dr. Arnott founded the Lake Placid Sports Medicine Laboratory, where he trained Olympic athletes. He was also the medical director for a 100-plus hospital national emergency service. He was selected first to be on air color commentator for ABC's Wide World of Sports, and then CBS This Morning with Diane Sawyer. Later, he went on to the CBS Evening News with Dan Rathers, then NBC's Dateline, Today Show, Nightly News. He continued on as a war correspondent, joining the 1st Marine Division for the invasion of Iraq and in Afghanistan, and then through the War of Terror. He hosted a two-season TV show called Dr. Danger and now continues to cover urgent stories like COVID-19 for Fox, PBS, Al Jazeera, and Larry King, while undertaking many new projects in deep learning and broadcasting. One final note before we get started. We'll be taking your questions towards the end of the session, so please enter them in the chat window. And now, without any further ado, welcome Dr. Bob Arnott. Shandu, thank you so much for the gracious introduction. Very, very uh, pleased to be with you. Great to have you here today. Thank you again for joining us today. So, uh, Dr. Yeah, Arnott, yeah. to start yeah. out, I'm curious, what got you interested in this exciting field of machine learning? How did you get started? Well, you know, Shannon, I, like a lot of people, kind of looked at artificial intelligence and said, not for me, too complicated, uh, too mysterious. And uh, so, you know, I started to poke around a little bit, saw how effective it could be in healthcare and in medicine. And I just started to take some online courses. And I said, you know, this isn't that hard. When you dig into it, it's, it's not that difficult. It's incredibly interesting. And, you know, I have been uh, a data junkie my whole life. You know, there's nothing better than taking a mass of data. For instance, with my sports science laboratory. I believe that. And, 
you know, we, uh, for instance, we looked at how people would ski jump. And it turned out that if you pushed off very slowly, you then had a short jump. If you had great angular velocity at your knee, I mean, your knee came uncorked very quickly, you have a very long jump. So we were able to mine this data out of very sophisticated equipment. We wrote this at MIT. We wrote it with the uh, various sports teams and up at my laboratory at Mass General. And with this, these tremendous insights jumped out of us. I mean, a massive data said, hey, jump faster, you know, push faster. And with that, we went from last in the world to close to first. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are uh, mystified by data. They just look at a bunch of numbers and rows and columns. And yet it's fantastic in terms of the insights that it gives you, whether it's as an athlete uh, or simple examples. For example, you know, Netflix uses uh, machine learning to figure out what movie you want to watch, which is pretty cool. Right. When you put your uh, your various new pictures up on, uh, on Facebook, it determines who those people are using machine learning. So we see it everywhere, but you know, it's just much more accessible than anyone would have uh, ever believed. Now, this, this is exciting, and uh, like you, I'm a bit of a data junkie myself, love data. Um, so you use data science, you use the words machine learning. Now, you also hear about artificial intelligence that, again, became popular a while back, and then it has seen a resur resurgence, right? So help us demystify these words, right, of these terms. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, you have a good background in that, data science, what is the difference between all these? Are they all merging and trending towards the same thing? So, you know, uh, the term artificial intelligence was developed, uh, actually, Dark Village is behind me here, in the uh, 1950s. And, I mean, we didn't have any capabilities back then. It was just, you know, kind of a fun term to use for a lecture and a paper. And I think it throws a lot of people off because we don't have anything that's truly artificial intelligent. There's, there's nothing that mimics a human being. Uh, all of what we call artificial intelligence is like the canyon intelligence, one very tiny, narrow little piece. So when you strip and rip the cover off of artificial intelligence, you really have a couple of things underneath. One is what we would call machine learning. And the way to think of this is it basically takes, you know, it takes a, a whole bunch of data and it figures a pattern out. And that pattern would be what we would call a classifier. That is, do you have heart disease or don't you? Do you have diabetes or don't you? Do you have cancer or don't you? So it's sort of yes or no, which of those do you have? We can go through a couple of examples later. So, you know, that's that's pretty simple to get into. And they're very good tools. Now, you mentioned data science. Anybody who's currently in data science or interested in this is set up for a success in both machine learning and data and, and deep learning. And that is because they understand data structure. You know, data in medicine health is crazy when you have it from insurance claims, you have it from electronic medical records, you have it from a laboratory, you have it from you know, radiology, all kinds of different data. The data scientist is in an ideal position because they're able to take and organize that. And it's one key thing to walk away from. It's this. If you can just organize your data and clean it up so you don't have missing values or duplicate records, it's not <clears throat> unbalanced in any way, then you can then use any of these tools. Some of them are off the shelf. Some of them you don't have to do any programming at all. Right. Now, having explained that, Shana, let me then go to deep learning. So deep learning is uh, still a lot more mysterious and fascinating. You know, deep learning basically is what we call these artificial neural networks. And the idea is, you know, that you would have in the human brain a whole bunch of different neurons, and those neurons would have hundreds of thousands or 10,000 connections mm -hmm. between every one of Billions of neurons. Right. So the idea was to try to replicate that. And so in deep learning, you'll have your, your input layer here, and then you have a variety of what we call deep layers, which is what they call it deep learning, with all these interconnections between them. And that's where you kind of learn so much more about data because it's constant looking at the data and trying to figure things out. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. One of the neural networks is called a convolutional neural network. And what that does is it analyzes images. And it's been the biggest breakthrough of all in terms of deep learning and artificial intelligence. When you look at the various scans that we would have, for instance, I think there's like 2 billion chest x-rays every year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how could you learn from that? Well, what you do is you, you take, you might take 100,000 of those x-rays for, say, a lung cancer. 
and you take the readings that very, very good university professors have of those. So you truly know, you know, which ones are positive and which ones are negative. And then you have the convolutional neural network go, go at it. And it will look at every little curve and every little smith be able to determine itself what's cancerous and what isn't cancerous. And with that, then you have the ability to, in a small little hospital like we have up here in Vermont, take a CT scan or an MRI or a chest X-ray and get as good a diagnosis as you would get at a top university medical center. So wonderful tools, incredibly helpful, very practical, and we see them all day long in everything we use. Right. No, that that's great. And and again, thank you for helping us understand the, those differences. Machine learning predominantly classify data into some segments and answering questions, yes, no type of questions ultimately. Deep learning, the system really learns on its own once you give it a ton of data, right? So and one of one of the more common questions I get is, how do I get started in this field? We have students, learners of all ages, and some have backgrounds in data science, some do not, some have background in coding, some do not. And in, in anything new, sometimes there is fear about, will I be able to really understand and learn <coughs> new things? So how should one think about getting started in this field? So. Here's the advice I give my own kids. I have a, I have a 31 year old, a 25 year old, a seven year old. And, uh, you know, with a 25 year old, especially, I have all of his friends, you know, they've gone through college and kind of looking for the next thing, or they have friends who are still in college. And they have all these kind of ideas that just cause anxiety. They run around with them all day long, like maybe I could do artificial intelligence, maybe I could deep, do deep learning. And they don't ever take any action. They think they have to go and actually, you know, sign up for a big university program. What I advise them to do is to take their smartphone and find a good online course. And, and we have some terrific ones coming up on healthcare. And what's changed in learning is that rather than having to sit down for an hour and a half lecture, many of them to get immersed in this, in three minutes, someone's going to give you a good little trip introduction, just like you have, right? You're right. a provost. You understand this. You've given people in three or four minutes a very good little introduction. Right. So. Learning's changed in that, you know, maybe as you're walking to a bus or a subway, or maybe as you're going up an elevator, or instead of going and checking, um, you know, your, your Instagram, your Facebook, just take three minutes or four minutes or five minutes. It's all what I would call chunkized. You know, it's a little chunk, so you can pick up bits and pieces and kind of mull it over and do the next little piece. And many of these courses will have a free, you know, three or four initial chapters, uh, or I know that you know, you're, you're going to have some totally free courses that will be introductory that people will be able to jump in and watch and get a sense of this. And then just see if you like it. See if you like it. Dig in a little bit further. So what I did was uh, I looked at a big introductory course by one of the, uh, the founders of artificial intelligence, uh, Andrew Nick from Stanford and Google. And I found it, you know, very, very theoretical and very complex. And I was frankly a little bit put off. And then I found some very good online courses that were just a lot simpler and had these little chunks. And from there, then your own curiosity takes over. You know, once I took a, a boot camp on artificial intelligence, it's like, well, you know, like linear algebra is really important. So I took linear algebra for deep, deep learning. And again, the key with online learning is that anybody can learn anything. It's not like the old days where you had to have four years of some kind of a prerequisite. You can dive in and you can learn. And, you know, the dream, that the reason I really wanted to partner with you, Chantanou, is that, you know, you have this, this dream, this vision of being able to close the tech gap for the hundreds right. of thousands of tech gaps that are out there and just make it much more accessible and much more affordable. So, you know, whether, uh, uh, you know, it's somebody that's been laid off during the COVID epidemic or it's you know, some poor kid in Aleppo, Syria, or out in, uh, uh, you know, Upper Egypt, or someplace up, uh, you know, close. You know, it gives them this opportunity to be able to earn a certificate, get a job, and get started regardless of what their background is. If they're energetic and they're ambitious, they're going to succeed. Yeah. Now, you couldn't have said it better. One of the... Uh, goals and vision that we have is to make education accessible, especially the the tech skills gap is growing. We hear from organizations, employers all the time that they can't hire enough um, colleagues and employees 
who are trained. So making it accessible is absolutely part of our vision. So, so just to summarize what you said is get started. There is plenty of online courses available. Start taking this, these courses in bite-sized chunks, right? Three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. And then there is so many places to learn these from, right? And if you don't like for the next one, but content is available in, in many cases. So that's, that's what you know, I'm like. You don't like the professor change. And just to give you a sense of these, many of these courses are like $9. I, I took a, a whole AI boot camp. It was many, many hours. And they're very good overview. I think I spent $9 on it. So it's inexpensive. It's just your time. And ju just think about your ordinary day. You don't have to sit down and plug away for an hour at a computer. You can just you can literally walk around with your sm smartphone plug in a chapter and, um, and get started. So I love the way you said that. And I, you know, there is just a huge tech gap out there. If you look at jobs, you know, the number one job in America now is data science in terms of salary. I mean, you have six figure salaries for people early on in their careers. There's a huge need all across the spectrum and it's wonderful, fun and fascinating uh, as a career. So, you know, a lot of people, including my own kids, are looking at a pivot during this uh, COVID era. You know, they right. might have been the service industry. I have an older son who's been kind of video production and whatnot. And he's going to do a big pivot just because, you know, now's an opportunity if, you know, if you're, you're down on your luck, and a lot of us are, uh, you have an opportunity to, uh, to really dig in, find something, pivot, and, and really plan for a very bright future because this economy is going to come back. And, yeah. Uh, you know, we are going to do well, but but get ready for it. Don't don't sit around worried and anxious and depressed. Uh, there, I mean, there's a there's a phrase. Uh, I won't uh, offend anybody, but it's like you know, don't let a crisis go to waste. And that's very much true here with this kind of a crisis. Look around, look for opportunity. And it may even be if you know you you are unemployed that it's a great opportunity for you to be able to dig in, find an educational program, sign up, get up, get ready as the economy comes back. Uh, and be ready for uh, you know a new life and a and a new era in economy 2.0. A lot of people think that economy 1.0, you know, is a vast service economy. Wasn't that great? And the 2.0 with the ability to you know work anywhere, use these zooms, have all the amazing tool sets on your computer, <clears throat> frees us uh, to live where we want uh, and get much more involved in the the information and artificial intelligence era and something we love and that has real legs as a career. Right. There's some statistic you were sharing with me, Dr. Bob, the last time we spoke was in a single day, we are producing more data than ever before in, in history, something like that, right? You, that, that you shared with me. That love oh, to yeah, hear, hear that statistic again. It's fantastic. So there are a couple of them. One is that, you know, we as individuals are putting out about 2.4 gigabytes a day of our own personal data. So now take United Healthcare with maybe 125 million. Uh, ensure to do the math on that. It's a lot of data. So they're now measuring data in exabytes. And if you were to take, you know, three or four exabytes, that that's like a thousand gigabytes. It's so much data that if you took every single word ever spoken in every language since the beginning of mankind, that would be how much data you have. And that's how much we're producing every year in healthcare. Wow. It's, just, it's just way too much data. The other problem about it, about it, you know, you've been very good in terms of, you know, data it's how important data science is in this because it's really the organization of data. You know, healthcare data is, to be frank, a mess. You look at an electronic medical record, it's not all in nice little columns and rows. You know, it's dictation notes or handwritten notes or, uh, you know, it's an MRI or a lab or, or stuff. And you know, it's very hard to pull that together. So right. they're using natural language processing now to be able to pull out and try to put that into nice uh, rows and columns. So, you know, we, one of the things as we go along is to talk about you know careers here, and if you currently are in data science or like data, you're going to have a, a big future. Even if you don't know all the intricacies of machine learning and deep learning, you're going to be able to prepare that data, look at it, comb through it, size it up, mm -hmm. you know, graph different elements of it, see what you think the relationships are, and then pass it on to a machine learning team, or use one of these sites online, which is which are which are free and allow you to sort of. Uh, plug and play without coding right and just a follow-up question on data itself so what makes data good data 
So it's a, it's a great question because, it, you know, it starts, of course, with the accumulation of data. That is, for instance, I have, as you can see, these smartwatches here. And some of them create, you know, great data, some don't. As an example, heart rate. For anybody who's ever used heart rate when they exercise, if it's just on the wrist, it's not that great. If you have a chest belt, it's a little bit better data. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you have the, you know, the flawed accumulation of data. So it may be bad quality data. Another example, here in Vermont, if you had a COVID test, someone would write that down on a piece of paper, they would go to the CDC in a few they put another piece of paper, and then somebody would then put it into a computer. Think of all the errors you could make along the way. So once, you know, look very carefully at how you're accumulating data, how good the source is, how good the tools and techniques are. For instance, uh, Apple Watch now is a way of looking at the most common of all heart arrhythmias, which is called atrial fibrillation. And, you know, it's almost as good as a very, very professional device. But, of course, you can watch it over a much longer period of time. So right. look at the quality. But when you have it in, there are really three key things to look at the data, make sure it's good, clean data. Do you have missing values? And there are techniques in machine learning and deep learning where it can actually take a, a mean and put a value in there for you if you think it makes sense. Second would be you may have duplicate records, which you want to get rid of, which, again, is fairly easy to do. Mm -hmm. Application. Uh, Right. And then the third thing is you want to you want to balance your data. So one of the things that's so fun about uh, machine learning as you start out is there are these wonderful libraries. And think of a library as, you know, like taking an app off an iPhone or a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And one of them is called Scikit-Learn. Another one's called Map. And with these libraries, you can take and just graph out the relationships between the data. So as an example, let's say you're trying to determine whether or not somebody has congestive heart failure. And in your data set, you have a thousand people without congestive heart failure, and you have one person with congestive heart failure. Well, it's terribly unbalanced data. There's no way you can get anything out of it. So you're sizing up the data. This makes sense. Do we think we have relationships in this data? And what you'll find is if you take just, just two factors, and that might be, say, blood pressure and blood sugar for diabetes. With heart disease, a tight connection between sex and age, you know, pretty tight connection there. But you're looking for more. So you may have a hundred columns there and you'll see little relationships there, but that's where the magic of uh, machine learning and deep learning comes in. I, you know, when people ask about machine learning, I take this example, you know, Shen, your, your parents probably did this, you know, you have to breakfast and say, oh my God, I guess I breakfast with my parents again, what am I gonna do? Well, they bring out this little sheet of paper that has a hundred dots on it. You know, I wonder what that is. You start to fill them in, and to fill in, you go, at the 70th dot, out of 100, you go, that's a bear. Mm -hmm. So what machine learning does is it, it's able to recognize patterns. If there's one concept to walk away with, it's this. When I started computer programming, I'm sure we started coding too, you know, it's machine level programs, incredibly complex. To learn to write thousands of lines of code to get anything out. And this was completely beyond the reach of anybody. The real joy of machine learning is the data is writing the computer program for you. So you take really good, clean, wonderful data, you put it in there, and the machine is writing what we call an algorithm. It's figuring all the stuff out. It's writing out an algorithm. So once it's trained up, then you could take your data and put it in. So as an example, let's say you have a prediction of whether or not somebody has diabetes or not. So you have a, a training set, and that training set basically – teaches the computer. The data goes in there and the computer looks at it and molds and uh, oh yeah, I see those relationships. And then you would test it, you know, does this really hold up? Look at the test data, look at the accuracy, you need 70, 80, 90, 95, 98%. And then finally, you're ready to use your own data. It's ready to, to go into action. So it, it's a joy to think you just, you gotta dump it in. You're sure it's good data. You know what you're looking for there. Right. And it, it, it writes the program for you, which is uh, what's transformed up here because uh, coding is hard. Yeah. No, that's that's right. So we're getting some questions from our audience already, uh, Dr. Arnott. So I'm going to actually go to one of the questions, which was also on my list. So Kerry B. has asked, if I wanted to get started in a career related to AI and healthcare, what would be my first steps? So, uh, I, you know, I, I look at both as healthcare is a, a big industry. You know, does, uh, I don't know whether Carrie can write as we're talking. This might be fun if it's interactive, but I, Carrie, I'd ask you, you know, 
do you have a sense of what you want to do in healthcare? You want to do administration, which your eye is very strong in. You want to be a nurse, you want to be a doctor, do you want to be a researcher? Because we call this bilingual. Uh, I'm a physician, but because now uh, I've learned deep learning, machine learning, I'm bilingual. You know, I have I have the AI skills and I have the doctor skills. So that's what you're looking at. You're looking, Carrie, at being bilingual. So you want to figure out what is in healthcare you want to do, and you can type that back online if you have an opportunity. And then with the, the deep learning, machine learning, I mean, I would literally go online. There are wonderful sites there. Uh, you know, you just search it and it'll pop up there, look at them, look at the courses. And once this course is over, uh, you know, go and just pop up the introduction. All of them have a three or four minute introduction. Goes that interesting. Look at a couple of free chapters. And again, for $9 or so, you know, buy an introductory course and dig in, get excited about it. And then once you, once you have, then figure out, you know, what are the job requirements? Uh, a new course I'm doing with Chat News on machine learning. At the end of the course, we have 10 real companies uh, that really have jobs, that have the jobs listed. And you can look at what the requirements are. Do they want a university degree in it? Because you have a certificate in it uh, and game it out. But they're both wonderful choices because, you know, especially in this, this COVID era, Healthcare it turns out to be, you know, the most robust of all careers in terms mm -hmm. of longevity. You know, if you go into healthcare, you know, you, you probably really do have a job for life, which, you know, wasn't isn't true of many other industries. And then, as we were saying, with deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, there's a huge tech gap, a big need, and uh, you know, very very good salaries to come uh, come with it. So, in essence, you've chosen the best two possible careers and put them together in terms of longevity, having a job, interest, and a good steady income. Yeah, no, I like that. Just to summarize, health administration, as you definitely mentioned that, and within that, again, health information or health technology. And this is a statistic I, I remember reading a few years back, is a, a good portion of the healthcare jobs and growing jobs are in the health administration, health information side. It, it, so they're non-clinical, non-patient facing, roughly about 40% or so are on the health administration. So definitely take a look at that. And applications in data science or applications in, in machine learning would, I would presume, would sit on the health information side of, of healthcare. So definitely a great place to start. A um, couple other questions, let me, while I'm, I'm on this um, chat screen here. So Tony S. has asked, how will AI and ML change the future of healthcare in the next five years? So it, it's such a good question because it's like, how is it going to change in the next three months? I mean, it's so it's moving so unbelievably fast. But to, to kind of uh, go to the imagination machine, uh, you know, take a Disney-esque look at this, you know, any hospital worldwide, you're going to be able to get an x right, and you're going to get a result that's going to be as good as the best doctor at Harvard or Stanford or Yale. Um, if you are having a stroke in your small little hospital in rural Illinois, mm -hmm. you're going to have an instant reading of that as to whether you have a stroke or not and whether or not, you know, you need to be treated. I think the biggest thing for me, though, is that we're going to go from a system of, of catastrophic health care where people mm -hmm. have to have heart attacks and have to have strokes and have to develop cancer to be able to follow them on a, on a, on a millisecond by millisecond basis, uh, warn them, coax, coax them, coach them, intervene, so that we'll be able, to, there'll be less disease. For example, um, there's a major university, there's a picture of mine here, uh, they spent roughly $10 million on a, an artificial intelligence system and looking at all these wearables. <clears throat> And they found there was a sharp decline, sharp decline in terms of hospitalizations uh, in the university, you know, the uh, utilization of healthcare, because they were able to find so much so early. So what I would say is, you know, that uh, some of the diseases we see now uh, will be much less apparent. I think your individual risk is going to decrease. Uh, I've actually just uh, written a new book called Flip the Use Switch. And in that book, we look at a metric called heart rate variability, which you can measure on these watches here. And that actually shows how old you are physiologically. Why is that important? You know, in London, when they looked at patients who ended up on ventilators from COVID, many of them had what they call a black biological age, which meant that they were many, many years past 
They're actually, so maybe they were 70, but they had the biological age of a 90 year old. So we're going to be able to take and, and truly reverse age so that people are physiologically much younger. So I, I come out physiologically at 25 and, and uh, it's uh, wonderful to be able to, you know, look at life like a, like a, you know, a 25 year old through your whole life. So, you know, it's going to dramatically change the quality of life. But we'll have much better interfaces. That is, we're going to have much better ways of interacting so that rather than looking at, you know, complex data screens, a, a huge part of this is going to be uh, user interface. I, I actually took a whole career course in user design just because I think it's the interface that's incredibly important in terms of pulling all this data together that you can kind of, you know, look at a metric on a screen and it's going to give you a solid piece. Uh, piece of advice. Um, I, I, I'm a nut when it comes to a uh, user interface. And I'll look at them. If, if it's not satisfactory, uh, you know, I think people just don't engage. They just an interesting side. So uh, Nicholas at uh, MIT uh, was a great uh, mentor to Steve Jobs and Apple. And yeah. interestingly, his background was that of an architect. So all the computer geeks said, no, 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 no. It's computation that's going to win. That's good. So that's what's going to win the battle. And he goes, no, it's the interface. Wow. The interface is going to win. And it did. I mean, just look at our iPhones. We're doing the most complex calculations here just, just because we have this interface up on top of it. So interface is going to change. And I would say, too, that's also a great way to enter into this space is to understand user design, user experience, because in the end, you're looking at how do you convince people to do something. And there's no better example than this current COVID era where you have, you know, mass confusion coming out of government and public health and media. I mean, no, you know, people just don't know what to do. Wear a mask one day, don't wear the next day. Wear this kind of mask. Wear that kind of mask. You know, it's yeah. just, it's endlessly confusing because someone isn't sitting back looking at the data. So to use that example, uh, The Lancet, a very famous British medical journal, one of the oldest of all, looked at 122 different studies and they found, and for sure, if you're using kind of masks that healthcare providers use, you're getting a 96% protection against the virus. Mm -hmm. Use a surgical mask, 67%. Use a bandana or something, probably closer to 40%. Keep yourself three or more feet away, 84% protection. Every extra three feet doubles that protection. Mm -hmm. And if you wear eyeglasses, some of your glassware, that's a 78% protection. So that's the biophysics. That's it. Very clear, very simple. Right. And right. just figure out, you know, what you're what you're going to do from there. So I think and it's going to be much, much better quality data and a lot more of it. And from unusual places. Uh, for instance, we're now looking at depression and anxiety uh, with your with your smartphone. That is, are you making fewer calls? Are they shorter calls? Are you speaking I mean, more slowly when you make the call? Are you moving around less, visiting less, going less places? So um, it, it's going to be pretty remarkable. It's going to be it's going to be really fun, and <clears throat> I think people will be they won't realize they're using it. Just like you don't realize you're using when you use Netflix or when you throw a picture up on Facebook. It's going it's going to be seamless and uh, in the background. Yeah, no, it it is fascinating, Doctor Arnott. We're actually getting quite a few questions here, so let's try and see if we can hit as many as we can asked earlier, which goes back to maybe your interface thing a little bit. So if you could briefly uh, explain about this. So Carissa H. asks, how will communication with doctors and healthcare workers change due to advances in technology? So Chris, this is a great question. I think the number one change is going to be telemedicine. Uh, and that means that, you know, you won't have to leave your job or, or home or home office or <clears throat> if you're taking care of kids, you're going to be able to do almost all of your health care via telemedicine. And the change in telemedicine is that, look, you go to a doctor's office because they can examine you. Now you can use telemedicine to be examined by the doctor at home. They have these range of devices. They can look into your ear with an otoscope. They can look into your eye. They can look at your skin with a special device. They can follow your blood pressure, your pulse, your, your uh, blood sugar. So they're gonna have much more data and they're gonna be able to do that uh, from a remote location. And it also means, I don't know where you live, but Chris, let's, let's say you live in, you know, rural Louisiana, as an example. You're going to be ha able to have, you know, the best doctors at Stanford or Yale or Harvard uh, examine you. You'd you be a, a very much more democratic system in terms of the ability to use the, uh, uh, you know, use telehealth. So I think that's big. And then the other big thing is, that, again, 
you're going to be watched on a on a minute by minute basis so that as insight come up they'll be able to warn you again that you may have an asthma attack or your blood sugar is too low uh, and maybe you should eat some more or the it's too high and you might need some more insulin we'll have the automation for instance with with diabetes that you'll have you know pumps that are very accurate they'll be able to with an artificial pancreas um, be able to uh, to treat your disease so i just think that we're going to have much better overall outcomes you know mm -hmm. in um in medicine we have you know one word that counts the most and that is outcome for instance i wrote a book 20 years ago called the best medicine and in that book we looked at will you live or die if you have heart surgery and if it was out in california at a small hospital there was an 18 percent chance you would die if you were at the cleveland clinic there was a 0.9% you would die. And once these figures were put out there, hospitals tried very, very hard to all get online and you know get better rates. So with outcomes, we're going to go across the whole spectrum of, out, uh, of healthcare, and you will have vastly improved outcomes um, across, across all the chronic disease. And we'll go from, you know, kind of Below the line, you know, here's here's the disease line here, hopefully pulling up to wellness into a much, much, much higher overall level of wellness. Yeah. Let's take a, a career-related question here. Mark C. asks, I don't have a healthcare background, but I do have a background in business analytics. Can I go into healthcare field in AI or machine learning? So that's a great question. And I would say... Yes, absolutely. Well, data is data. With that kind of a background, you'll be able to easily master both machine learning and uh, deep learning. Uh, in the courses that I'm doing with Chattanoo right now in, in uh, mode learning, and, uh, in machine learning, and, and in deep learning, uh, we have a whole variety. There isn't going to be anything very different about it. I mean, clearly you want to have you know some kind of expert knowledge you're able to create, but uh, you'll be able to very easily fit into a healthcare administration position, as an example. Uh, Shana, you were saying I think that forty percent of you know healthcare is uh, in some kind of administration. So absolutely, I would jump into this and you know use some of uh, our data sets if you want to. Like you'll be able to load these up, and you know an understanding of the disease is going to be helpful. But you don't have to be a, a doctor uh, to use an example with a mammogram. You know, uh, is it cancerous or isn't it? You know, you don't have to be an expert on the microbiology. You just have to have a system that is able to accurately predict with great few false no negatives or false positives, whether or not uh, this mammogram shows a cancer or not. Yeah. So yeah, I would say a big yes. Big yes, Mark. <laughs> um, all right, so there's a question here from Eric Y. And if I'm understanding this correctly, what Eric is asking is, where would you spend the next two weeks learning in depth? So I'm, I'm not sure if that's directed for you specifically who has taken 40 plus courses on this, or is it just in general, if you have only had two weeks, where would you start, which you've already answered? And Eric, if I'm not reading this correctly, please do chime in um, with, an, with a follow-up question. So Eric, uh, you know, I would, I would dig in online and just do a search, uh, you know, depending on if it's, you know, automotives and machine learning or it's, uh, you know, healthcare and machine learning. Uh, there are lots of great sites. Um, I mean, uh, you know, Coursera, Udemy, DeVry, there are very good sites out there. And I would start with the free and inexpensive courses. That is, poke in them a little bit, see what you like. Uh, if in the free three or four chapters you like the course, spend nine or ten dollars, you know, buy the course, dig in, uh, and just get excited about it. And, you know, and get a variety of courses. You know, you may get four or five chapters in, and you could get a little bit stuck. Uh, and you want to take another course, uh, dig in a little bit more, but 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 just dig in, you know, spend spend and in two weeks, I guarantee you, you're you're going to be very up to speed on on all of the the technology, all the language, uh, be able to use some real use cases, uh, and decide for yourself that this is for you and and how you want to dig in. That that's good advice. Is you know, in, in as little as two weeks or four weeks, you can take plenty of online courses and figure out if, A, this feels, feel really fascinates, in, in, fascinates you, in which case, keep going. Or B, it's also good to find out if maybe this is not for you and, and you can dig in the same in, in, in another field. So good, good question there. Um, Renee H. asks, 
which AI skills are needed for future success in HR operations? I'm guessing that's HR in, in healthcare. Maybe that's where you start. But if you have general comments about HR and, and artificial intelligence, would love your thoughts on that. So, you know, Renee, I think that, you know, that, that machine learning is, is great for human resources. Uh, just on a rudimentary level, in terms of being able to, you know, segment through candidates, as an example, looking for potential problems. As a classifier, you're going to be able to classify problems. Now, the interesting thing is you get into the deep learning parts of this. There'll be much more sophisticated stuff uh, in terms of, you know, how much does somebody socialize? You'll also have all kinds of ethical issues. I mean, very, one very simple one is this. I mean, let's say you do you have the right to follow their uh, their smartphone? Do you want to see that they went to a bar or a restaurant last night? You know, did they, did they travel down to Houston, Texas over the weekend? So there'll be all kinds of Nettleson problems, but the whole variety of new and very subtle tools. And especially in the deep learning area, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, psychological matches, it's already, you know, when you're putting teams together, you may more accurately put those teams together based on compatibility and skills and how complementary they are. So uh, I think it'd be great. I would start out with the machine learning part of it just because, you know, a lot of this is just going to be classifying people. And then as you want to get into the more sophisticated aspects of it, you know, you'll be all set once you know machine learning because you're going to know data and how to input the data and what it is. Um, and then I would also, you know, I would take your questions and also, you know, focus on outcomes, you know, what are your outcomes? Obviously, you want to have better employees, and once you have them, you want to keep them. Uh, you want to keep them happy, <laughs> as Chad Tenure does. As I can tell you from everybody I've run into at Dubai, you know, you really want to keep people happy and satisfied and pulling. Uh, you know, a lot of times employees aren't going to tell you if they're unhappy or they have a leader that's, uh, you know, angry or uh, you know making them upset or. You have so just like with illness, we're trying to be preventive and find that illness before it declares itself in an emergency. The same thing with HR. You want to find out, hey, here's a team. People are unhappy. Uh, you know, they're starting to cast around. We're starting to get, and what's, what's wrong here? You know, is it the leadership? Is it a bad boss? And unfortunately, there are bad bosses in America. You know, how can I facilitate reporting so that people don't feel that they're compromising themselves and they end up on some kind of a, you know, uh, a red line list because they, uh, you know, they, they, they complain. So you're going to be able to be much more, bottom line, much more proactive in uh, HR than you currently are. Great, great. So let's take a couple more questions. The questions are coming in fast and furious here. Hodo J asks, how will learning, how will learning this prepare pre-med students to succeed as doctors? So how will learning this, meaning the AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, prepare pre-med students to succeed as doctors? So as a pre-med, you know, they're going to want to know if you have some ability to research. You know, a lot of universities you want to see some research background. And whether you're using, uh, you know, MATLAB is one of the applications is used more specifically in healthcare. Uh, but, you know, I would dive in by, by learning Python, which is, uh, if you look at all computer languages, it rates number one as a data science, uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning uh, language. And it's number two overall. JavaScript's number one because people design websites with it, but it's the number two language. So I, I would learn Python. i dive in. It's going to help all your coursework there. And I really think that as you apply to medical school, you have to look at an edge. You know, what's your edge going to be? You know, hopefully you have very good grades, you've taken the prerequisites, but is there something there? And I think that the deep learning gives you the something there. And in, in your courses, you're able to apply, maybe you've done some research projects, you can do those on your own. And then you have something excited to talk about. You know, a lot of people, when they go to interviews, uh, you know, the Shannon more than the most, you know, we all stiffen up. It's yes or no, or I want to go to university because I want to freeze up but a great way to get through that interview process and to write really compelling essays is to have something you're passionate about and you will find real passions in artificial intelligence stuff that you love and it may also help direct you to the kind of career you may find gee you know, I, I love image processing the convolutional neural networks 
and medicine. And, you know, maybe I want to go into radiology or neuroradiology. Or I want to be a neurosurgeon. I want to be a cardiologist. So I think we'll uh, direct you, but it's a wonderful thing to start right now. And you can do it in bits and pieces, you know, offline, you know, learn a, learn a, a Python and uh, you learn some of these skills because you have a long time there. And then have something you're really animated and excited about, which is going to help you get into medical school and help you be a much better doctor once you're, once you're in and through. Yeah. And I remember you and I were talking about this is it, it is becoming increasingly important for doctors to know how to use this, right? Not, not know how to code, but not know how to, you know, program things, but at least know how to use it for better diagnoses. So learning this at the pre-med stage is a great idea. So good question, Hodo. Um, there was a question here again from Eric on how will PII, so that's personally identifiable information, need to change to support collection of data? It's an interesting one. It is because, you know, what's happening increasingly is that we have this new kind of, you know, uh, area what we would call precision medicine. Or what is that? That's the kind of technical name for it. And so, you know, in the old days, you go, I have a high cholesterol, I'm going to take a cholesterol lowering drug. I have high blood pressure, I'm going to take a high blood pressure lowering drug. Uh, you know, very kind of brute force, uh, you know, very, very simple stuff. So this precision medicine is going to take the greatest intricacies and the greatest data set that there is, and that is the human genome. So you'll have your whole, whole human genome. And as you know, that's just an instruction set. What's it doing? So then you're going to look at the, the messenger RNA that basically sends out to make stuff happen. And then you're going to look at what are you making? Proteomics. You're making this particular protein. For instance, in COVID, are you making a tremendous amount of inflammatory proteins, in which case you may be at higher risk and may actually be a candidate for some of these medications like colchicine early on or dexamethasone a little bit further on. So being able to look at the clinical indicators we currently have, but against a very highly personal background. So to use COVID again as an example, they in Italy looked at blood types. Nobody had any idea. They weren't just looking at blood types. But out of this pop, this conclusion that if you are a type O blood type, you're going to do better, which is very interesting to know. So now, as a physician, looking at you and your particular risk and your other risk factors here, I am better suited by knowing your genetic background, knowing your, your blood type. So I'm just trying to think of what, you know, what another real world example would be. I mean, it's like- and Dr. Uh, Bob, maybe just let me just interject. Sure. The, the, I think the, the question around PI was more around the data privacy. So as you're gathering more and more data, are there concerns about data privacy in this? In oh, this I'm data? sorry, that's right. Yeah. So it's so a great question. You know, the, the, there is going to be, uh, you know, a whole field around data security. And in medicine, of course, we do have HIPAA requirements. I don't really see those breached very much. You know, people have the concern, and I think there's a career in it, in making sure that this is, uh, you know, all highly, highly encrypted, um, that people are using, you know, blockchain, uh, various technologies to be able to segment the data so people can't get at it. Um, I do think as healthcare insurance improves and as the laws improve for human resources, you know, that there'll be, uh, less of a, uh, you know, less of a problem should somebody find out. But look, we all want our data, right? We all, everybody has stuff that, you know, either they, you know, they just are, you know, hyper concerned about or, or, you know, that may cause a real problem if genetic data came out or, you know, you get a particular sensitivity. So, yes, I think that, you know, the data security in healthcare is a great place to be because hospitals fret about this every second and there's going to be some kind of a data leak so it's a very good question it's a, it's a very good whole area here because you're right as more and more of this information seeps in i mean you're having to come from every different source you have potential for data leaks every which way maybe even you know my smartphone uh, a particular sensor area am i giving up you know mm -hmm. critical data there or if i'm you know, sharing it on uh, Strava or another site. Am I, you know, accidentally giving up something that an employer might look at? I mean, as an example, I'm using these training watches. You know, do I have uh, a heart rhythm disturbance? Like, could somebody pick that up? And would it be used uh, against me in terms of getting insurance, getting health care, uh, getting a job? So 
Uh, it's a very insightful question. Right. Uh, and, and, and the answer is that, you know, data security is huge across, obviously, finance and all our other personal information, but of paramount importance, protected by HIPAA. Uh, and that's why hospitals pay so much attention to it. Right, right. I'm trying to get to as many people here with, who have posted questions here. So let me take one from Darren L. So what Darren is asking is, how do you get practical experience that is sufficient for working in the industry that is relatively new? So again, um, if you're relatively new, I'm, I'm focusing this again back to the healthcare, but let's say you're relatively new to the healthcare industry. How do you get practical experience that is sufficient to land you a, a role in that industry, which is new for you? So it's very, very interesting. I was talking to, uh, to Google about this and the interview is no longer, do you like to go fishing? <laughs> you know, the, the new interview is, can you code this for me? You know, so see if you can code that problem. So I ran into the same thing. When I started taking these courses, um, a lot of them had what they call cookbook code, where you could download the code, put, put it in, plug and play. And the course that I'm, I, I'm doing right now, uh, for Shannon Machine Learning, actually has that. So when that's online in the next couple of weeks, a month or so, you'll be able to go on and do that. What I would say is take as many practical examples as you can. So there's a great site called GitHub. That's G-I-T-H-U-B. They have contests on there, so they'll give you a sample problem you can beat. But more importantly, you'll be able to pick up hundreds and hundreds of different examples, which are completely coded data sets. Because I ran into this problem. It was like, okay, so I know this stuff. I know how to do it, and I know how to code it. But how do I gain an experience? So obviously, if you can do an internship anyplace, or preceptorship, or someplace you can volunteer, I would jump in and do that at a heartbeat. But on the way there, do use sites like GitHub. And every day, uh, take another example, pick it apart, look at how they code it, take it, practice it, upload a, a site. You'll have lots of practice in terms of uploading data. Simple to intermediate to much more complex calculations uh, and computations and, and scenarios uh, using GitHub. So a great site for this. Great, great. So, Dr. Arnold, we are nearing the end of our chat here. Fascinating. We could talk all day. But if, if, if there was some advice that you would like to leave for our students, for our learners, those who are already in the field, those who are thinking about healthcare, those who may be intimidated by machine learning, and those who have already had a background in business analytics, right? We get students of all types. What, what advice would you have for them? Uh, any parting words here, Dr. Arnott, as we close our session? So, so what I would say is, you know, as, as you go to sleep at night, as you lie down and you close your eyes, you know, use your imagination. Envision where you could be. That is, envision you could have a much better job, a very interesting job, a very good career, stable, a good salary. Envision all those. Envision working with, you know, smart and interesting people. And there's nothing more fun uh, than working with super smart people like Shannon, you know, he is super smart. Uh, and, and then once you have that kind of vision, you have that groundwork and that motivation, then as I say, dig in, go online, take these very inexpensive courses, get a sense of it, see if you like it or not. And I did that. You know, I was looking at learning uh, artificial intelligence. I looked at a bunch of different other things to do. And I didn't like it. I got it. Well, that's not for me. I don't understand it. Or that's not very interesting. So see what interests you. But the big thing you have now you didn't have before is access. You don't have to, uh, you know, apply to a university or for a master's or PhD program right away and just figure out you don't like it. You can you dig in and find it. But you know, remember that uh, we're in a very troubling time in terms of careers. You know, uh, with this sort of COVID outbreak and people are very worried about it. It's, it's, you know, I'm on every day with my own kids, very concerned, very anxious. Uh, people, I'm actually doing a series now with Mass General. The next piece of it is going to be on depression, that it's it's doubled in this COVID era. So against that, you really want to take a big step and say, look, this is going to be over one day. You know, what, what could I be? And really imagine, don't get caught too much in the practical. Where, where could you be and how could you develop the skills and just be the best that you, you ever can? And, and as a final thought, Chan, you know, you know the old days you go and you have a college degree and that would take you, you know, through a 45 year career. It's not like that anymore. You know, you, you've got to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. And so 
I have, and I highly recommend having a portfolio of skills, and it might be that you have user experience and machine learning and healthcare skill, and have a portfolio of learning you're enthusiastic about. Have a portfolio where every year you're learning new skills, because it's so much more accessible, so much more interesting. It'll make you a more interesting person, and a wonderful research paper out of Harvard shows that you know we, we came out of the cave and made our way into this digital era because there was an intellectual reward in the brain for learning. The more we learn, the more interest we have, the happier we're going to be, and the more satisfying life we're going to have. Oh, great. No, great, great parting words here. So become a lifelong learner, right? Have the mind, right mindset and get started, right? What, what, what great started, advice. It's right. Dr. Arnott, for sharing your interesting and helpful insights into this field of machine learning, artificial intelligence in the area of healthcare. So thank you again. And now viewers, stay tuned because in a moment you'll meet my colleague, Chris Campbell, who is the CIO at DeVry University, and he'll be speaking to John Higginson from Groupon. So thank you again for this first segment. And Dr. Uh, Bob Arnott, thank you again. Have a good day. Right, thanks for the great interview of you, and thanks for all you're doing for education and uh, inspiring the next generation to, to lead great lives and their wonderful careers. Wonderful. Thank you. And stay tuned, everybody.